So welcome everyone to episode uh, 57 with uh, Dr. Luke Kelly, who we are delighted to uh, th that he's joined us. His PhD, um, I, 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 I make no um, sort of secret of this. I've shared it several times on various social media. It's, it's, I think it's a great read. It's got some awesome images. Just glancing at its title, In Vivo Function of Human Planter Intrinsic Foot mus Muscles. So when when you know we've had a bit of um, a bit of an appetite for talking about the foot and and foot strength and foot rehab and foot intrinsics, I've had a few requests for this over the months, and there was really only one one option in our mind as to who was going to come and talk about it, and that was you. So thank you for joining us, Luke. I know it's early for you, six, 6 a.m. So um, massively appreciated. Um, we've had a load of questions come in um, from various different levels, and I've tried to assimilate them in some kind of sensible logical order um, and we're going to start off um, with a question that came in from from an undergrad who's clearly studying and, and they're at that kind of time where learning more about anatomy and, and they apologized for how basic this may be for a man of your stature and I said I'm sure he won't mind and they just wondered if you could just summarize what what are the intrinsics and you can kind of take that question in whatever direction you want you know just just a summary for the undergrads of, of what the intrinsics are uh, I, I guess the easiest definition would be, um, and that hopefully an anatomist doesn't pull me up, would be to say they're the group of muscles located within the foot. So they have origin and insertion located within the foot. So there's the plantar intrinsic foot muscles that are on the bottom surface that we've spent a lot of time looking at. Um, and then um, the dorsal ones as well, so the, the extensors. Easiest Perfect. definition. It's, no, it's, it's actually a... The first paper we published in this area, we had a, a lively debate with one of the reviewers as to whether abductor hallucis was actually an intrinsic foot muscle. So, um, there, you know, it's, it's it's not a silly question because it's a debate that, that lots of people have. And what was the debate there, if you don't, if you can recall? Uh, well, the the debate was that it's outside of the arch of the foot, so it's not an intrinsic. But I think oh, we've okay. since I think we've resolved that since. You got you got your own way. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's get straight on to you know their, their function. Let's get straight into the, the the meaty stuff if we can. Um, and if any questions um, if any questions come in, Craig, on the Facebook that want us to take things back a notch, then 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 dial you know rein me in. But um. One of the papers you published with your colleague Dominic Farris was was about their importance during locomotion, which I think is a, is a pretty good place to start. So, can we can we just get you to, to talk a bit about their role in in gait and, and movement and um, and things like that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I guess that particular paper was the culmination of uh, I'd say seven seven years of work into these looking into the function of these muscles. So we probably need to go back um, a few steps before we get to the end product. Um, when, when I first uh, started thinking about a PhD, um, I was at Aspatar at the time in, in Qatar, and I had the opportunity to do a PhD um, part-time under the proviso that, that what we did was related to my clinical role. Um, so, my supervisor, Andy Kredzel, said, why don't you look at the intrinsic foot muscles? It doesn't seem like anyone knows anything about those muscles, so why don't we have a look and, and see? So you go back through the literature and back to the early work from Man Inman and Baz Margin and his colleagues, um, and they did some really cool experiments using fine wire EMG back in the 60s, which, you know, to do that then is, is pretty phenomenal. And we had a kind of a baseline understanding of maybe when the muscles turn on and when the muscles turn off and, and how they respond to, to load. But we really didn't have any context around their actual function. Um, they suggested based on timing of EMG that maybe they, obviously they flex the toes, but maybe they're important for stabilising the toes during push-off. Um, but it wasn't really much else there. So we kind of thought, oh, this is a pretty open area that, that's worthwhile having a look at. Um, and this is, this is kind of pre-barefoot running as well, before um, all these other questions start to come out. So we developed the technique to actually look at the function of the, of the uh, intrinsic foot muscles. So I'm actually going to share my screen here. Um, lovely, lovely. And... 
Hopefully this works. So we have a slide up here. Can you guys see that slide? Yes. So basically we developed a technique using ultrasound, which um, the, the people going before us didn't have the availability of this, so it was much harder for them. But we go through the inside of the foot. Um, we focused on the three biggest muscles, abductor hallucis, quadratus plantae, and flexor digitorum brevis. And we use a needle to thread these fine little wires about as thick as the, the hairs on your leg into your foot. And then we remove the needle Um, once we hook those up to uh, an EMG system, we can have a look at when these muscles turn on and when they turn off. And one of the first experiments that we did was, was a, a simple uh, loading experiment where we tracked the movement of the arch um, as we loaded weights onto the knee. So this, is a, this was, a, um, I guess, a replication of Baz Margin's study. Um, we went up to about 150% body weight and we basically found that as you loaded weights over the foot, the arch deformed, so it got lower. And then we have this kind of bottoming out here at the bottom, so this buttressing of the arch. And we actually see on the right column, this is EMG of these muscles, we see the EMG really quiet to begin with, but then it increases exponentially as we increase the load. So what we hypothesized based on these findings was that these muscles are actually buttressing the arch. So as we, as we increase the load, the muscles turn on and then they stiffen the foot to, to prevent this excess deformation. And, and looking at um, the data here, it, it sort of sits really quite nicely with that. Um, the the follow-up experiment to that, we actually, instead of recording EMG, we actually put wire electrodes at either ends of the muscle and delivered current into the muscles. So what this allowed us to do was to have an isolated contraction of each one of these muscles and then track how the foot moves when we stimulate the muscle. So it's hard to voluntarily turn these muscles on in isolation. So this was a nice way to get around that. And the other thing we wanted to see was the muscles are pretty small. Can they actually make a difference to what the foot does? Um, so we stimulated these muscles, delivered trains of um, electrical stimulation and then tracked how the foot moved. It wasn't a particularly pleasant study, uh, but it was pretty cool results. And, and what we found was, if I can find this other slide, um, when we loaded the foot, the foot deformed, so we saw the arch got lower, so sagittal plane, we saw extension of the forefoot lowering the arch, we saw eversion of the calcaneus and abduction of the forefoot in the transverse plane. And when we stimulated each one of these muscles, we actually saw a return toward the unloaded position. So basically what these muscles were doing was they were, they were not only countering that deformation, but they were actually reversing the deformation. Um, and when we think about uh, how these muscles work as a group in unison, um, we kind of hypothesize that if they can do this on their own, when they act as a functional unit, then they must really have this ability to stiffen the arch of the foot, which is you know, quite novel and quite unique in that it's not just the plantar fascia that's, that's uh, providing this function for the foot. So then we um, moved on a series of experiments in between, but we had uh, Glenn Litchwark and I planned this experiment a long time ago where we thought the next way to really determine how important these muscles are was to test in walking and in running um, their impact. And, and we thought the best way to do that was to temporarily remove the ability of the muscles to contract. So we gave, um, we gave nerve blocks to um, to these, uh, to the tibial nerve behind the medial malleolus, or just above of the medial malleolus, actually. Um, and what that does is it, it removes the ability of the muscles to produce force um, for a fairly short period of time. And then when we did that, we, we took a whole lot of measures. It was quite a, um, quite a difficult study in that we had a lot to do in a very short time window. So we took metabolic data and we, had um, 
obviously our motion capture data so we can track how the feet and legs move. We did it on an instrumented treadmill, so we had ground reaction force data. And ultimately, we wanted to see if midfoot stiffness changed when you didn't have foot muscles. And our hypothesis was that if you don't have foot muscles to, to stiffen your foot at those really high loads, then we would see much greater deformation in the foot. Um, and this was a classic example of our hypothesis being wrong. We um, actually found that midfoot stiffness didn't change at all when we didn't have foot muscles. Um, so this graph you'll see here in the middle here, this is a, a joint angle moment curve. So this is in biomechanics, we use the term quasi stiffness quite often. It's really hard to measure the true stiffness of a, of a joint or in this case, a series of joints. So we have this approximation um, where we plot the joint angle joint moment curve. And this is a midfoot joint. So obviously it's a, it's a series of joints, but we model it as one joint. And then the slope of this um, angle moment curve here um, is, a, is a measure of joint quasi stiffness. And we, we, we see there is some offsets there, but in this, um, when we have the block in the gray and the non-blocked in the black, there's no real difference in the slope. So midfoot stiffness stayed the same regardless of whether we had muscles or not, um, which, which was really quite interesting. Um, and then we also looked at the, the MTP joints with a similar approach. And the slope here is different because the MTP joint rotates differently. But we did see quite a substantial drop in MTP stiffness during push-off um, when we didn't have foot muscles. And then when we looked at from a, um, from a mechanics perspective, we actually see much less positive power, so propulsive power coming out of the foot when we don't have foot muscles. And we also have um, less coming out of the ankle as well. So the muscles don't seem to stiffen the arch or the midfoot per se during running um, or walking but they do seem to have a really important role in the energetic function of the foot. So the ability to generate propulsive power at the foot, but also at the ankle. So when looking at this now as the role of these muscles in stiffening the MTP joints and how that might influence the dynamics of the ankle joint. So the function is slightly different to what we originally anticipated, but there's still an important function there. Um, <clears throat> and we, maybe we can get into that a little bit later, but. Um, we're kind of thinking of these muscles as, as these adapters that can modulate the energetic function of the foot, depending on what we need to do when we walk and run, whether we need to speed up, slow down, um, jump, land, uh, do various tasks. But um, the, the plantar fascia appears to be, from a, from a structural perspective, and I guess the plantar ligaments are included in that as well, um, the, the tissue is primarily responsible for, for maintaining the stiffness of the midfoot. Awesome. Thank you so, thank you so much for that. That's, I'm just scribbling something down because there's a question in about three questions time that comes in where I'm going to need to re, re, re repeat to you what you've just said and check my understanding of correct as well. So, um, a couple of your papers, uh, use the word spring-like in the in a couple of your published papers use the word spring-like in the title um yeah. so, you know the spring-like spring-like function of the foot and listening to you talk about kind of the the, the modulation of stiffness it, it, it makes just such sense that that we're we're talking in the terms of um of the foot being like a spring do you mind just uh, and, and we're going to come on to sort of how shoes and or or foces may positively or negatively interfere with that spring-like function in a second but do you mind just um Expanding on your thoughts of, of the, the human foot as a spring. I mean, I guess it kind of ties in ties into what yeah, you just said, doesn't it? I, I think um, I've got a few slides here and, and it probably will tie into a conversation on shoes. I'll just again share my screen. So there should be a picture there of a runner and some springs. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So moving away from the foot. Um, humans and I guess a lot of other terrestrial animals use what we call spring-like running mechanics. So um, we often model this as a, as a spring mass model. So we have a central um, mass which, which kind of represents the mass of the body, um, sits at the center of mass. 
and then we have a spring that sits under it, which is our legs. So when, we, uh, when we're running, especially when we're running, um, as we hit the ground, our forward velocity slows. So our, our kinetic energy declines and our, um, our center of mass height gets lower. So then our, our gravitational potential energy also declines. So we have this large amount of energy within the body that's, that's, temp, that, that's, mo that's removed. So if we um, don't do something to conserve that energy, then we're going to have to use our muscles to generate more energy to, to keep us moving at the same pace. So we have the ability to actually temporarily store this energy in our tendons. Um, the Achilles tendon is the best example of this. So as our um, center of mass lowers, we go into ankle dorsiflexion that stretches the Achilles tendon. And we can store a lot of that energy, that, that kind of declining potential and kinetic energy in our tendons. And then the tendons give this back via elastic recoil in late stance, which then drives our center of mass up and forwards and helps to maintain that that constant running velocity um, in a really, I guess, economical manner because our muscles don't have to perform mechanical work or they perform less mechanical work than they would have to if, um, if we weren't using these elastic um, mechanisms. So um, getting back to the foot now, Kerr uh, published a paper in Nature in 1987 which um, does which elegantly used a cadaver to to show how the foot can also store and return. <clears throat> so when they compressed, they they applied a load from the top of the foot, and then they watched how the foot deformed for a given force, um, and then they gradually resected all the ligaments in the arch of the foot and looked at how that changed, and they basically came up with the idea that the foot can store about 17% of the total mechanical energy required for a stride um, and give that and give most of that back. So this term, the foot spring mechanism, um, it's been evaluated over the years in a number of <clears throat> different experiments. More recently, um, Sarah Stern um, and Jonas Rubinson did a study where they blocked the spring-like function of the arch and measured how that influenced uh, running economy. And they, they came up with an 8% difference. So I think the, the storage capacity of the foot is somewhere in there between 8 and 17%. So it's, it's quite substantial what the foot can contribute to the, the energetics of, of running. Um, so we have, I guess, looked at the contribution of the muscles to this function and, and removing them via the nerve blocks, I guess, highlighted that if we don't have muscles, we, we don't get as much energy back out of the foot um, as we do when we do have muscles. Um, and we published a paper in Journal of Applied Physiology last year showing some of the strategies that, that, um, that the muscle, that, that the central nervous system uses to, um, to allow this to happen. So our flexor digitorum brevis muscle is, an, is a model for the other intrinsics. When the foot deforms and the arch gets longer, the, the flexor digitorum brevis muscle contracts isometrically or, or fairly isometrically and what this does is it stretches the tendon of uh of the of the muscle and allows energy to be stored in the tendon so again that means the muscle can function at metabolically favorable lengths and velocities and the tendon can store the energy and return it like an elastic band um, so the, the foot certainly plays an important role in this and there's certainly potential that um that shoes or, or other um, technologies can enhance or can hinder this, um, this function. Yeah. Sorry, look, can I just ask a question? This is a, a little bit off topic, um, but I'm, I'm not aware of the literature on this, but is there any relationship between muscle strength and stiffness? Uh, I'm not aware of, uh, uh, as in muscle strength. Of like, the like is, is a weaker muscle going to return less energy? I, I, I have no idea. I, uh, I, I couldn't yeah. answer the question directly. I, I know that we see altered dynamics and altered behaviour in conditions yeah. like cerebral palsy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I guess the muscle's not returning the energy. The tendon is, tendon, yeah. so. is, is the issue that, that's returning the energy. So any energy that you get out of a muscle is via a concentric contraction. Yeah. 
I suppose yeah, weakness is going to affect that anyway, which yeah. I'm challenged with at the moment, but that's another issue. Um, so, I mean, we're talking weakness. I'm just thinking, where do we take this conversation now? And, and we may as well get stuck straight into the the fleshy part of the clinical discussions and conversations that we see very regularly, particularly on social media, um, which which talks about um, sort of foot strength. Um, and I guess we're coming on to the paper that, that was published in the BJSM um, by Irene Davis and colleagues, which was a, a paradigm uh, sort of referring to the foot core, which um, maybe we should start by kind of just refreshing people's minds of what that paper suggested. And then I guess I'd love your take on um, given what it suggested and given your, your deep understanding of the intrinsics. Uh, do we have any concerns about that paper? Does it have any strengths? Where do we, where do we, how do we bring that into practice or not? Uh, okay. So I, I think the, it, it's probably come in for some criticism, certainly in podiatry circles. I always see people keen to, um, to, to talk about it. Um, I think it's from a, from a general perspective of heightening the awareness of the fact that we have these muscles in the feet um, that are potentially important and muscles in the leg that, that insert into the feet. It, it's, a, it's a nice piece of work because it really has increased the awareness of, of these muscles and their potential role in the foot. Um, there is, you know, there's, there's a few issues there. The biggest issue for me is probably not what you might think. The biggest issue for me is that it almost conveys this message that the foot is an inherently weak, weak structure. And um, we have these stabilizing muscles and if the muscles are weak, then we have um, impaired movement patterns and deformity and injury. And it, it, it's really not the case that the foot's a marvelous structure. The foot is, uh, it's incredibly robust. If you think about what the foot does every day, um, it, it, it really is marvelous. So I, I, don't, I don't like the idea that the foot can be conveyed as as a structure that needs to be stabilized that is inherently weak sure we see in clinic we see people who who have foot pain um, that may be related to mechanics in some instances um, but uh, uh, the message that goes with it is, is probably how the message is sold that's the thing that i have the, the most issue with yeah uh, i think we all share that that concern and the suggestion certainly with when you put the the slant of the, the you know the barefoot narrative uh, on top of it is is that you know the human foot is is marvelous and it's it's supposed to act like a spring so actually if you have any kind of orthosis or even shoe that, that that's in place that isn't air quotes a barefoot or natural you're going to negatively interfere with that that spring like function you, you certainly published a paper uh, that looked at the spring like function and running shoes um that, that my interpretation of your your your, uh, your data didn't seem to support that contention um well the, i think that paper you could probably flip the argument either way i mean we showed that when you run in shoes you have less motion about the, the about the midfoot so you have reduced compression or deformation of the arch when you run in shoes um, but we also showed that we had increased activation of the muscles. So the, uh, uh, based on our study, and it was, it, it's, it's an initial transition study. It's not looking at people's, people's adaptations over an extended period of time. So that's an important caveat. Um, but when people who habitually wear shoes go barefoot, they have more movement through the arch and less muscle activation. Um, so yeah, I could I could spin it either way depending on how you want me to. We, we could say you know greater movements, greater energy storage in return. Less muscle activation means it costs you less to do it. Um, or we could say well for some people greater movement is not necessarily a good thing. Um, it really depends, and that's the the for me at the moment the big limitation to a lot of these um, strength training or even you know looking at how foot orthoses influence. Um, muscle activation in the foot in the leg is we don't know what normal is um, normal is a huge a huge span of what we see and generally most of what we see is just a variation of normal um, so we don't know if a bigger muscle is a better muscle um, we see if we look at the the uh, group from Leuven um, 
who looked at foot muscle morphology in people with normal feet and as they described asymptomatic overpronated feet the people with the the pronated foot posture were actually the people that had bigger foot muscles so the concept that um a flatter foot is a weaker foot is not necessarily the case because these people have bigger foot muscles um so there, there's a lot of kind of um gaps in our knowledge that need to be filled before we can really start making meaningful inferences about who would benefit from strength training um both in a clinical setting and from a performance perspective as well yeah i think that's a great take home um that flatter foot doesn't equal weaker foot because that's definitely the way some people are, are spinning this story isn't it and you, you, you mentioned orthoses and just to quickly touch on something i know that most people listening will have have been asked at some point in their in their clinical career and if they haven't that they're going to at some point and that is that someone's read a blog and they've heard that foot orthoses uh, weaken the foot um and i know craig is is, is is talking about this for a while we where's where does the data uh, sort of send us on this one is that can we say that it's frankly true that it's frankly false or is it currently inappropriate to be so dichotomous uh i would say the latter i think it's at the moment based on the evidence it's inappropriate to to, to be so dichotomous on it. I, think I do know of a study that's been done here at UQ, not within our group, where they've looked at how foot orthoses influence foot muscle function and, and morphology. Um, I haven't seen the data from that yet, so I don't know the answer. I also know of an abstract that was presented last year from a group in Canada, I believe it was Waterloo. Um, I haven't haven't seen that paper in details either, but they suggest that long-term use of foot orthoses decreases intrinsic foot muscle size. But if we go back to the the study from Kay Leuven that says that people with a, a more pronated foot posture have larger foot muscles, then is that necessarily a bad thing that these muscles are getting a little bit smaller when we're in orthotic? So perhaps, and this is a big perhaps, perhaps they're bigger because they're, they're doing a lot more. So perhaps taking some of the load away from those um, overloaded tissues might be a good thing in some instances, but we don't know. It's the big answer. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? You, you can see how people might, may see the abstract of, of a paper that said orthoses um, make foot muscles smaller and that would, they'd immediately go, oh, I like, I like the sound of how I can, uh, I can portray what that means. But as you've already touched on, like, we don't know what's, what, what size means just yet. So, um, yeah, yeah lots, of, I think, lots of... I think the one thing there is to say that, generally speaking, being stronger is better, you know, in, yeah, in terms yeah, yeah. of performance and injury. Actually, just, just on strength and the intrinsic muscles, Luke, given that they're such small muscles, you know, and you... Um, work hard at strengthening them over a period of months. Given they're so small, is that increase in strength going to have much of a functional difference? Uh, well, I, mean, I know there's no data, but we're, we're speculating. But this is, uh, again, this is the huge hole. Is mm. um, we have some really nice stuff, and and I saw Sarah Ridge present um, a paper at the Canadian Ped Orthics conference last month uh, that they published in MSSE last year where they've shown that if you wear minimalist shoes you can increase the size and strength of your intrinsic foot muscles to a similar amount as a foot strength training program um, which would be um, which would really be fantastic if, if we needed to make someone stronger and we could just say wear these shoes and that will work um, then then that would be brilliant. But the, the missing link there at the moment is the link to function. So we don't yet yeah. know if we make these muscles stronger, does it actually make any difference to the way they, the way they move when they walk and when they run? Um, there's some evidence there that maybe your foot posture changes when you do it af after a strength training program, but I'm not quite sure of the mechanism for that because these arch height index measures or, or foot posture measures that the intrinsic foot muscles aren't actually active when they do those tests because in bilateral stance, these muscles aren't active. So it must be some other change that's causing a change in foot posture. Um, but in terms of dynamic function, we don't know if strengthening the muscles actually changes 
dynamic function. Yeah. Okay, Luke, jo, jo Reeves has just posted a comment. Um, she's going to be presenting an abstract at the FBS meeting showing that intrinsic muscle's foot size does not change after wearing foot orthoses for three months. There we go. So there's Excellent. no change. Can't yeah. wait. I can't wait to see it, Joe. I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you going to the Canadian yes. meeting, Luke? Okay, I'll see you there. I, I just want to say hi to Joe. I didn't know she watched these things, and uh, it's cool to know. It's cool to know she does. And I still remember when she uh, she put a uh, fine wire EMG into my tip post, and she'll always have a place in my heart for that. That was miserable. <laughs> um, let's talk about. We'll come on to the. We'll leave the exercises till last. We've talked about exercises, and the questions come in about those and. And you know what that what exercises might look like, you know, uh, and we'll talk about that last. I think let's let's quickly touch on a question that came in, which I think now is the right time to ask it, which is, where does pathology sit with this? So, it, what is the link? Is there a link, prospective or otherwise, or otherwise, with intrinsic foot muscles and and pathology? So we see a lot of um, people say, okay, you've got plantar fascia pathology. Um, that means as part of your, your overall kind of plan, we're absolutely going to get you to do some intrinsic muscle work or whatever it may be. I mean, what do we know about whether these, these muscles predict pathology or what their role is in treating pathology? Do we know anything? Um, well, we have some limited knowledge. So plantar heel pain is the first example you used. Uh, there's some cross-sectional data from well, a few years back now from um, Joe Hamill's group to say that that the intrinsic foot muscles may be a bit smaller in people that have plantar heel pain, but we don't know whether that's cause or effect. So uh, are they, are they weaker and are they smaller and subsequently weaker to start with uh, that that's contributing to the pathology or are we seeing changes in their function due to pain um, that's making them get smaller? Um, we know we see changes with diabetic neuropathy. We definitely see changes in the intrinsic foot muscles there. Um, but we don't really at this point, to my, to my knowledge, have, have data linking strength or muscle volume or, or morphology in general to, to um, prospectively to, to any kind of pathology. Yeah, perfect. I mean, it's certainly probably since the publication of the, the foot core paper, like you said, absolute bonus that people were now thinking more about these things. They probably were neglected, um, inappropriately neglected for, for quite some time. Um, but then it kind of went, the, the pendulum perhaps swang quite aggressively the other way and every single sort of, uh, I certainly knew, knew of a few uh, people, not podiatrists, but local to me, where every time, every time a foot pathology of any description went through their clinic, suddenly they were getting intrinsic re intrinsic exercises um what, what are your thoughts on that too far the other way no why not can't hurt <laughs> yeah. actually yeah. Just, um but it's it, compl uh, it, exercise adherence is probably the the yeah. the big question there i mean if 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 you can provide any, any exercises lower limb calf raises whatever it is for people it's not going to hurt yeah. Yeah, but I think on that, look, I was just about to ask from your, from your previous comment that, it, it, say, in plantar heel pain, if we don't know, is it cause or effect? But if they're weaker, they probably should be rehab where there is cause or effect. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, we could make sure. that argument. Yeah, and, and your, your rehab, uh, it, it, I guess digging into some of the pain elements of it too is interesting as well because yeah. potentially you need, to, you need to target those sides of things as well. Yeah, but I think just reflecting on that and thinking about the foot core model i mean part of that if you if you read the that paper and the model it was to um you know pathology is present you do your foot core strengthening um and you go through several iterations several cycles of that um if that doesn't work you then go to orthotics but the to me trying to rehab or strengthen that foot core it's not going to happen in a in a couple of months you know no. like you know that they're in pain <laughs> you know and that's the yeah. I, I to me i just see you know you know i mean i'm a huge fan of the short foot exercise and, and it's being widely used but it's not going to produce results in the short term <laughs> yeah i'm not a huge fan of the short foot but we can oh, talk about that in a little while why uh i i think from a mechanics perspective yeah. um it's not particularly reflective of what those muscles do okay. during locomotion and the the load you know, the, if you think about the magnitude of, of, of 
load about the midfoot or talks acting about the midfoot during walking and running, they're, they're so, so high that you can yeah. never really get those muscles to produce enough force with the task That's like that. That, that, that it's going to make any meaningful difference. Sure. So how would you approach it? Um, I think um, uh, I think any task where you are like heel raises or, mm. or anything where you're really shifting that center of pressure f- a long way forward in the body, in the foot, um, under load. So, you know, heel raises are the easiest thing. And, and, and one thing, I guess, anecdotally that we've seen consistently in a lot of these loading experiments we've run over, over the years, and we've done probably, I don't know, maybe four of them now, in different iterations is that there's a lot of there seems to be a lot of inhibition on these muscles so whether that's occurring at the where that's coming from whether it's coming from the cortex or whether it's uh, happening at a spinal level we don't know but it takes a lot of um excitatory drive to get these muscles to turn on they don't turn on in double leg stance they turn on in single leg stance and when we've done these loading experiments, we've always noticed that unless we have um, a lot of activation in the calf muscles, um, then it's really hard to consistently get these muscles in the arch of the foot to turn on. So there's some kind of coupling between the plantar flexors and the, the intrinsic foot muscles, which makes complete sense. Um, it could be mechanical. So when you generate an internal plantar flexion moment at the ankle it shifts the center of pressure further forward in the foot and and makes the loading higher at the midfoot or it could be a neural thing sure. um, so that when we have drive coming from the plantar flexors there's some kind of facilitation there onto the onto the motor neuron pull from the from the foot muscles yeah actually that's really interesting because I, I don't know whether you caught that paper i, I, I can't even think the the reference but I'll, I'll dig it out and send you it came out a few that literally a few days ago and it looked at plantar fascia thickness in those with Achilles tendinopathy. Did you, and it was. No, I yeah, haven't yeah, seen that actually. I, I've only just, I haven't had a chance to even look at it yet, but from memory, the plantar fascia was thinner in those with Achilles tendinopathy. Okay. That's I interesting. Think, I think I'd have to, I'd have to check it, but, but that, yes, that actually may, that may be consistent to link with what you were just saying. Yeah. <laughs> so pain in the Achilles is actually inhibiting something in the plantar foot. Yeah. yeah, so well, well, yeah, so coming back to how we prescribe exercises, yeah. I mean, for me, if I'm seeing someone with heel pain, most of my patients who get heel pain will walk out with exercises, yeah. probably like a, like a, a modified version of, um, of Michael Rathleff's yeah. protocol, but more targeted at, um, you know, plantar flexor strength and intrinsic foot muscle strength during those, those heel lift type exercises. And that's, probably a baseline for me that's where it starts i don't spend too much time on trying to get people to turn a specific muscle on or move a foot in a particular way that's really kind of not really organic to how the foot moves so just talk just i know i know a few people watching will want will want to want to know more about that so just talk about the modified raffle if you've got them single leg standing uh, hallux dorsiflex under a rolled up towel if yeah. I understanding correctly so far just what what what, what, what took me through the rest well I, I think um the original protocol from michael was by by dorsiflexion or extending the hallux under a towel you're you're activating the windlass mechanism so they thought that by dorsiflexing the toe and going up and getting people to do heel lifts that would strain the plan of fascia because of what's happening with the windlass it's far more complicated than that um because when you dorsiflex the toe under load it actually shortens the arch um so we published a paper lauren welty from queens published a paper on that last year so the, the interaction between the toe and the midfoot is is quite different to what we actually many of us actually think so you're not actually, I don't think you're really straining um, the plantar fascia too much there. So you, 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 by shifting the center pressure further, so f- dorsiflexing the ankle, so it looked like you're targeting soleus, I guess. Um, you can increase the load through the midfoot and then achieve it that way. So we're, we're focusing more on getting that center of pressure as far forward in the foot as we comfortably can. Um, to really increase the loads through the midfoot as opposed to manipulating the windlass mechanism per se. So 
you know, a lot of the time you don't even need to have, I don't think you need to have the, the Halix Dorsey Flex, but that's, you know, my opinion. It's not, um, don't have any data to support that. So essentially a single leg heel raise, but you'll ask them to uh, essentially lean for as far forward as is comfortable to get that ankle dorsal flexed. And yep. Yeah. And yeah, probably, yeah, and probably don't go too much. I've seen people play around with on the edge of a step going down into like a, a really dorsiflexed flexed ankle position. So that that's probably when you're really going to get more strain through that plantar fascia. Um, I don't play around with that too much. I'm not quite sure of, um, of how that will go and how much weight the body weight or we load you've already you know you, um, we talked about being, the, the load the load yeah look Sorry, I, I, I think in this kind of task where there's you know you state you're on one foot so there's a postural challenge as well um and you you're getting people to focus on keeping the foot in a reasonably good position through that task most people that i see so you know these aren't elite athletes these are recreational runners or um you know middle-aged people with heel pain they'll struggle to do 10 good single leg heel raises in that kind of body position so that's generally where it starts and some people that are in a lot of pain we just start with two feet yeah i mean the final question that came in and we're pretty much into it already was with regard to intrinsic foot muscle exercises <laughs> what what where what when and how we've already kind of talked about what it sounds like people are uh, far more likely to get that exercise from you than they are asked to pick up a pencil with their toes or scrunch up a towel uh, with their toes um i guess where, where does the progression go do you ever dial it back to the good old short foot or based on your previous comment you just you think it's it's a waste uh, of time well things that we've been speaking about the foot core i think i'm going to draw this back to a, an experience of mine i've had two shoulder reconstructions and i can remember after the second one my physio was obsessed with me doing core stability exercises to help stabilize my shoulder and i sat there for about six physio sessions trying to turn on my transversus abdominis and i just could not do it and it drove me up the wall to the point where i just said stuff it i'm not doing it anymore and I honestly think that sometimes getting people to do that with intrinsic foot muscles, you know, fan your toes, um, give me a short foot, all these abstract kind of movements, mm. um, sometimes it can be more disheartening than positive. Um, I know Narelle Window has a really nice program where she gets people to do those exercises as a control element, so uh, as a motor control task. Um, but, yeah, I, I think... You know, it's different from, say, the falls prevention approach where you're getting people to pick up marbles and it's, it's basic toe flexion and generalised movements of the toes, which, which can be beneficial. But these, you know, these exercises where we spend a lot of time on fanning the toes and, and doming for what, or doming or whatever they call those exercises can sometimes just be more hassle than they're worth, I think. Yeah. In the absence of yeah, any I think compliance with them is is historically been quite poor, and I think the reasons you say are probably you know people don't necessarily feel like they're doing anything, whereas it doesn't take many heel raises for you to feel like you're working, does it? Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's that's solid. Um, Craig, is anything I, I should ask because I've not got any other screens open? Has anything come in as we've been going no, along? We, we, just have a, we did, did just have a question on the short foot exercise for plantar heel pain, which I think we've addressed. Um, yes, I, I think we probably have actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, let me let me ask Luke while you're looking through the list. Let me ask Luke one question that's just come to mind. Um, is there anything that would come to see any clinical scenario that would come in where you would think um, it strengthening or, or giving rehab for the intrinsics would would be inappropriate? I mean, we sort of you know uh, flippantly sort of said get everyone to do it. What what's the harm? Is there is there any contraindication to to intrinsic foot muscle rehab? uh look no blanket rules that i'm aware of um even yeah i i, I i'm sure that there, i'm sure there is cases out there but i i can't think of any off the top of my head um no i'm not saying yeah, they should a, i'm not saying they should be used for everything <laughs> no but, no no um, but yeah. i can't think of any any particular case where you know where it might actually cause harm yeah. yeah. Actually, I know, I know, Luke, you don't, we, we try to, before we came live, we did have a bit of a discussion about questions coming up, but I, I've got a question. I just, 
curious about um, toe deformities and in intrinsic muscles. And you know, the traditional underst- or understanding or one model of core toes might have been you know, the, the role of the intrinsic muscles are to come around, you know, grab that proximal phalanx and hold that proximal phalanx on the ground. And it's either a weakness or a lever arm issue that the toes claw. Um, how do you feel about that model now uh, based on your work? Any... Uh, I, I think it potentially still fits. I, I just, um, they, we just don't know whether these things are cause or effect. You know, yeah. It, yeah. is there something else? Is there a third variable there that mm. we um, that we that we aren't accounting for that that might be having a profound influence on both of those things? Um, I think it was Rod, Rod Whiteley's presentation with you guys when he spoke about um, about summer and ice creams um, and sunburn. So, so basically, ice creams causing sunburn. Yeah. Um, I I don't know. Um, it, it it's plausible um, that for some reason those muscles aren't um, performing a, a given function. So then the, the toes uh, end up. It, it's mm. also possible that there's some intrinsic mechanical differences in in the feet of people that have claw toes as well. No, it's interesting. Um, I've I've had a question just come in. Uh, I've just just been texted to me actually. Um, and outside of the the lab, so outside of a of a of a sort of research or university setting, so within clinic, um, what's the easiest way to measure or quantify uh, intrinsic muscle strength? Is it even possible? Uh, that's a really really good question. I think uh, even within a lab, it's 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 probably impossible to directly quantify intrinsic muscle strength because you have the extrinsic muscles there as well. Um, I think there's certain ways you can ask people to perform a toe flexion task um, that will isolate these muscles. So we, for the, the neurophysiological studies we've done where we look at the motor unit properties of these muscles, we always get people to to plan a flex the toe or flex the toe, keeping the IP joints neutral um, and no clawing of the, of the distal uh, phalanx. So the idea there is that you're, you're using the intrinsics to, to flex the toe as, as opposed to the extrinsic foot muscles that attach distally into the phalanx. That's probably the best we can do. Um, and how you do that, uh, whether you do that standing on a pressure mat or whether you um, build a, a device, some kind of dynamometer device to, to measure it. Um, they're probably the, or you just qualitatively measure it with your hands. It's, it's probably as good as you can do in a clinic, I think. Yeah, like, any, like any muscle testing really. Yep. What about that test where you could just um, put a piece of paper under their toes and get them to pull the toes down and you try and pull the piece of paper out? I don't, don't know what it has a name or anything. Or I haven't heard of it. But if what if it tears, they're strong. And if it doesn't tear, they're weak. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. You probably tear the paper if they're strong. I, yeah. I just, yeah, it's, I know I know it's done in some some circles. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, okay. I haven't I, heard of that one. That's yeah. interesting. Craig, Craig, are you thinking of the way you're thinking of magicians taking tablecloths off the table? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, <laughs> Well, no, I mean, you assume if they're strong, you can't pull the piece of paper out and the paper rips. But yeah, we'll call it the paper rip test. Um, actually, Joe jo Reeves has just made another comment. She's looking forward to meeting you in Calgary. Um, but her question is, is, do you have any future directions for your research? Um, yeah. We, yeah, there's... Um, I, I'm at UQ here. We have... When we first started on this foot research, there was no foot research happening in the UQ lab here. Um, Andy Creswell, who is the lab director, was he, he's a neurophysiologist and a biomechanist and he has a strong interest in posture. And Glenn Litchwart has um, an interest in muscle and tendon. But at the moment, as it stands, I think we have maybe six or seven PhD students working directly in feet and about three or four postdoctoral fellows working in feet. So we have lots of stuff going on around the intrinsic foot muscles and then maybe um also starting to now we have a good baseline understanding of what these muscles do um we can start looking at some specific pathologies as well um yeah so we have lots going on at the moment it's pretty exciting it's busy but it's uh it's good fun awesome anything else craig or i'm just no i'm just i've just been reminded of a of a 
foot strengthening device that I'm frantically trying to find. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'll, 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 come, I'll come back to it. Yeah, sorry. What, a device that tests? Yeah, yeah. Tom, Tom Machard had a device for measuring and quantifying toe strength. I, I do recall it now, but I'm just, I, I'm, I'm trying to search for it while we're talking. I'm probably not going to have time to find it. Maybe post a picture of it in the. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll link. We'll link to it later if we find it. In so. the comments. Yeah. No, so that's Perfect. all. That's well, my, yep. Yep. That's great. Um, Luke, last question. Well, last last comment really. Um, is there anything? I mean, you talk about uh, this topic uh, every day of your life, all over the world. Uh, more published in it than, than 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 most. Is there anything we haven't touched on that? you would want the listening audience to to not leave before hearing or do you think we've um we've, we've done the topic justice no I, I hope we've done the topic justice um i think we've covered the <clears throat> the main points um certainly from a clinical perspective um yeah no i i think we've covered all the important things yeah perfect well, if, you, if you're happy then i'm certainly happy so yeah, that's no. good craig are you well, happy no that that's almost worked out perfectly we're just just about to come up to the hour so that's you know i'd like to knock these over in an hour because the audio version can only be an hour so look thanks so much luke i know it was before 6 a.m you were locked out at your office so it was a bit of a frantic start so and thanks to those all that have joined us we've actually had quite high numbers all the way through which has been pretty good um for those of you who've joined late, just come back in 10 minutes. The whole video will be there from the beginning after uh, Facebook renders it. I will get it up to YouTube later today and the audio version will be, audio, audio version will be up on iTunes and Spotify as well. Again. So thanks again, Luke. Great. And thanks, Ian. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Luke. It's fun. Th thanks, mate.